we will move from uh, an overview through detailed information to kind of give us all a background on this. And then we'll end up talking about the political aspects and what we can do. So first thing I wanna do is just show a picture about how amazing and beautiful this process is. This is sperm in the fallopian tube, an actual electron micrograph microphotograph, and it's an amazingly complex system, and we'll pick up quite a bit more information about that, but I, I just have a sense of uh, wonder and amazement and respect for the whole, whole reproductive process and its complexity at this point. I hope you end up sharing some of that. So today we'll look at an over -contracep overview of contraception just to kind of give ourselves the larger picture. Then we'll look at specific lessons learned from past research and experience, both women's and men's. We've had 70 years of women's contraception now, and we've had about 50 years of research on men's contraceptives, believe it or not. And then we'll go into modern male contraceptives uh, in terms of the microbiology possibilities right now, uh, and then benefits, what's really going on with research, what's live right now, the field is really beginning to uh, be active, very active and hopping with clinical trials. Uh, one now and up to six more coming within the 18 months. Uh, and then challenges, activism, and what we might do about it in terms of our own platform. So we know women's contraception has led to a major acceptance of contraception in general. And this is really a historical, a historical shift. We've gone in 70 years from where we were as a species for the last millennia uh, to 30% minimum acceptance of women's contraception. This is women's contraceptive use, which unfortunately is where we have most of the research and statistics. But you can see at the top of the graph that we're really not getting above 60, 62%, uh, even in the so-called developed countries. And um, we have some restrictions on further adoption by women, certainly in terms of cultural uh, aspects and um, you know, standard sexism, et cetera. Uh, but we also have a significant role uh, that men are playing. But that, that women's status right now is that nearly half of all pregnancies globally, even with 70 years of effort on women's contraceptive are still unintended. It's about closer to 40% worldwide and a close to 50% in the United States. And of those unintended pregnancies, 60% will end in abortion and nearly half of those are unsafe, causing tens of thousands of maternal deaths each year. So here's uh, one of our uh, questions and uh, you can put your answers in the chat and uh, Margaret will read them out. Take a guess. How many women's reversible contraceptive methods are there today? And if you read the abstract, you've got a really good hint on that. And Margaret, Margaret, if you might see if there's anything coming in on the chat. Five is the first guess. Mm -hmm. A dozen? A dozen's a good guess. A good one. All right, well, we actually have 10 contraceptive methods. And by that, I don't mean the specific, very small permutations of the drugs, but really what we might call the um, uh, uh, delivery method in a sense, the major components, uh, major possibilities. Caps and diaphragms, the traditional barrier methods, um, quite a few variations of hormones, including a hormonal intrauterine system. It's called an IUS. Uh, the physical copper seven is called an IUD. We've got vaginal rings, which are also hormonal. They're implanted. The plastic is implanted with hormones and they're actually 3D printed right now. And then we've got the old reliable emergency contraceptive pill. So let's take a guess. How many men's reversible contraceptive methods are there today? Let's see if you One want. One or two? Is the first guess. Uh -huh. Zero. <laughs> and the second person is right. It's zero. 
So men right now take a major role in contraception. About 30% overall is handled by men through condoms, withdrawal, and vasectomy. And it varies tremendously by country and is not particularly predictable by culture. Uh, Japan, for instance, which is one of the most advanced industrial countries in the world, 80% of married women are using condoms, which, as we know, has a pretty high failure rate. And uh, 3% of women are still using withdrawal, as high as 16% in Western Asia. And guess what country, you can see it on that fourth bullet, guess which country has the highest vasectomy rate? It's Bhutan. And then New Zealand, and then still quite a ways behind is UK, Canada, and the US. It's got absolutely no publicity and no public face, but a lot of men after they're finished child raising in these countries simply, oops, I'm sorry, go ahead and do choose um, uh, vasectomy. But let's look down further. We've got a 22% annual failure rate of withdrawal, 13% annual failure rate under typical use, not ideal use, but typical use for male condoms. And vasectomies are really good, but apart from a relatively small number of countries, they're not used that much. So do men want contraception? Well, that's one of the first questions that I get conversationally when I bring up the topic. Uh, and yes, the studies show clearly that men very much want their own contraceptives. If we were at an a and in person, and we were talking over some wine later at night, I could tell you some funny stories or reactions I've had from men hearing that there actually might be real a real pill for them or a cream or a patch or an injection. Uh, we've got 17 million men. And nine, what really surprised me is 98% of women said they would trust their partner to be the contraceptive user. I, I really surprised me. And then there's a major study in many countries, uh, quite a few countries around the world, uh, six from different areas and shows within 12 months, um, five of the six countries show that men would be using a new contraceptive men's method. It does take a while for the information to get out. So they evaluated how long men thought they would want to uh, think about it basically before they picked up on it. And within five years, we've got 75% or more men uh, would be using it. So uh, the next issue is, okay, what have we learned? If we're going to have men's contraception, uh, what do we um, want uh, to, to benefit? How, do we, how can we make it better and make sure we don't repeat any of the mistakes we've made with women's contraception? So a few of the things we've known are the hormonal contraception has serious side effects. They can be dangerous and fatal. It affects secondary sex characteristics, specifically acne. It creates impractical side effects like breakthrough bleeding, uh, the Norplant, which is no longer the current name, but uh, that basic idea of the, of the one to five little plastic matchsticks that is inserted under the skin of the upper arm and stays there five years. Uh, it's a very low dose and it leads to breakthrough bleeding, which is very hard to manage day to day. It can affect mood, quality of life, and people stop using it, and then they aren't using contraception. It's hard to take a pill every day, really reliably, uh, for year in and year out. Uh, no method is 100% effective, which was kind of surprising to me. Women's sterilization is only 99.45% effective. And given that the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, only funds women's sterilization. It funds the expensive tubal ligation for women. It doesn't fit, fund vasectomies at all. So couples could be um, you know, pushed into doing women's sterilization, which can have surg surgical complications that men's vasectomies don't. Um, uh, but even that's still not 100% effective. The, the fertilized egg is very persistent at getting through the fallopian tubes and uh, down into the uterus. Access by young people is key, having it free is key, and uh, combining it with um, sexually transmitted disease messages is helpful. And there's a phrase called LARC that uh, has come from the women's contraceptive field. It's the, considered the ideal contraceptive, long-acting, reversible, and the Norplant 
five rod has now gone down to two rods and one rod, which is in Planon and Jadel. And there's also Marina and Skyla, but these are all hormonal. These are larks for women. So what we need is larks for men that are not hormonal. Anyway, young women are more empowered today. They are um, um, kind of no longer just swallowing, so to speak, whatever the doctor recommends, they're likely to start or stop a contraceptive method on their own. And if they don't like it, particularly the hormonal side effects, uh, they'll just stop using it and then um, might have an unintended pregnancy. And one of the most important profound lessons we've learned is that contraceptive provision is best adopted and most responsibly, ethically and medically adopted if it's part of a comprehensive reproductive healthcare system. You don't just give out women's contraceptives. You teach women how, uh, how to, all the aspects of reproductive health care and provide that. And the other uh, point is perhaps pretty obvious, but there's an amazing diversity that is possible now in, um, in some contraceptions. Uh, so people want a different suite of options. When you're young, you might just want what's called on demand, which means tonight. You might want something that is last for several months. I'm not in a relationship uh, and I just want something that'll cover me. It might be long-term. I've, I've had two kids, I'm done. I've had, or it might be permanent. Um, it, there are so many delivery techniques right now with pills, creams, patches, injections, surgery, sorry. Um, there's different accessibility, particularly if you look at different cultures um, around the world, um, over-the-counter prescriptions or surgery in a doctor's office, privacy, can the method be noticed by a partner, and relationship. So those are 10 lessons learned from men's <coughs> contraceptives, I mean from women's contraceptives. And from men, now we mentioned that we have 50 years of contraceptive research for men already. And interestingly enough, not surprisingly, the uh, research establishment took the hormonal control approach that started women's contraceptives led to the pill and many of the most of the 10 methods we've looked at so far and they said okay we'll switch it over to men and it has led to the same set of problems loss of secondary sex characteristics depression acne and in the men's case a loss of libido which is a stronger effect um, than in women and it generally the once they brought the drugs into clinical trials, they failed. NIH had two big failures. They've been doing a lot of uh, publicity. They've sunk tens of millions of dollars into this research. There is a third one now from uh, another group, not NIH, uh, another hormonal one that is doing well with few side effects. But generally speaking, it's kind of using a, a blunt hammer to do what a small little uh, scalpel could do in a meta metaphorical sense. Another thing we've learned is that men want contraception. The earliest record of men using a condom is in 3000 BC. <laughs> uh, and uh, some herbs have a very long history in China and Indonesia uh, in particular, and Papua New Guinea. And men's reproductive systems have many intervention points. It's been surprising over the last um, 10 years when they started looking for things that would affect men's contraception, men's fertility. So they looked through the, the scientists, kind of what's called basic research scientists are paid just to search drugs for their impacts. They're not even looking for a particular impact. They just say, what does this drug do? And they do a wide set of studies. And a lot of them reduce fertility, but unfortunately, most of them do it and have other strong side effects. It, they have the drug at the strength that's needed to change fertility. And the other two are, the, the lesson learned is that the pharmaceutical industry is not gonna handle this, which is the logical question is, well, if it's such a big market and men want it and we can do it now with microbiology, why isn't it being done by the private sector? Well, first of all, the private sector is already funding women's contraception. Second of all, and, and they really just don't get it. They don't see that there's a real, need and a, a, a human right and a human cost to this. Uh, they are not going to invest the one or $200 million without exclusive rights to all distribution. 
Uh, they want to roll it out in the wealthy countries first and not bring it to the developing countries until up to five years later because they want to recoup their R&D cost and the profit before they even start rolling it out to developing countries. And there's also just the basic uh, sexist view that contraception is a women's issue. And uh, they, they just really have, they're non-players in this area. Uh, so let's quickly go into the part that I find most interesting, which is the scientific aspects of modern male contraception. What's new? Why is it hopping right now? And with modern microbiology, we've got the testes that can be affected and the epi ep epididymis, epididymis uh, which is the um, outer layer of the testes. Uh, it's outside the body in the scrotum because as we know, it needs a cooler temperature. So it's possible that if we can find out what the particular enzyme or protein is that is a, needs that cooler temperature, that could have a separate um, drug effect. That could be a target for a separate drug. Uh, we also have um, sperm production in terms of the brain pituitary uh, testes hormonal. This is the hormonal part here, uh, but we're also looking for direct action on the testes and sperm transport. Okay, so here's the fallopian tube uh, in, in the version in the male. The vas deferens is this long skinny tube that comes from the testes all the way up uh, into the seminal seminal vesicles where it gets mixed with the semen and then down into the prostate here. And so this is actually where the most promising, the current clinical trial is, is right on this um, vas deferens, which instead of being cut in a vasectomy, it has down here in the scrotum, it has a little bit of a, what's called a hydrogel put in there. It's a, a polymer. And if you put it in there, the sperm disintegrate as they try to swim through it. And they just never get to the other side of that little plug in the vas deferens. And that's been shown to last 13 years or longer, which is astounding. And to reverse the fertility on that one, you just inject baking soda and water and flush it out the vas deferens. And in 90 days, fertility is back. So that's, that's the one that's been the main focus of the last 35 years of research and the one that has the clinical trial going right now, finally. Uh, there's also interesting points with the sperm transport in terms of the semen. It turns out semen is quite a little miracle fluid. It has contributions from three glands, three accessory sex fluid glands, they're called. The seminal, seminal vesicles, which produce most of the semen, the prostate produces some, about 15 to 20% of the, the fluid comes from there. And then these two little tiny glands there are called the Cowper's gland. And I don't know why, um, uh, don't know, I haven't run across why, but they do contribute some to the semen as well. Um, and semen's pretty amazing. Uh, but then finally, there's the ejaculation. One drug actually uh, interferes with the uh, movement of the ejaculate uh, into and through the penis, and it results in what's called a dry ejaculation or a dry sheets pill. The man has the orgasm and he feels the orgasm kind of neurologically, but there's actually no physical ejaculation. And apparently they were in the, in the initial clinical trials, the guys didn't like it so much that it has been... Um, it's had trouble getting funding for that reason. The guys, it doesn't feel um, complete to them. Uh, so here's a fun fact um, that the seminal, seminal vesicles uh, produce most of the semen and semen has a complete backpack and life support system for, seam, for sperm. That's what the semen's real point is. It provides energy. It's got an energy drink, fruct fructose. It's got prostaglandins, which hide it from the immune response within the vagina. And it's got alkaline fluid uh, because the vagina is very acidic. Oops, I apologize for this. Uh, and it also has clotting factors which keep the, um, the sperm alive. So it's, it's really fascinating, amazing. And so here's another question for you all. Uh, 
take a guess, how long is the vas deferens? And you can see the vas deferens is that long skinny purple tube which goes up from the testes through the abdominal wall, winds around all sorts of other organs in the abdominal cavity and this goes back down and then ends up in to the uh, seminal vesicles. So if you guys wanna put your thoughts in the chat as to how long the vas deferens is, would be great. A meter on each side, maybe a yard, maybe, maybe 12 inches. Ooh, very good, very good. Yeah, it's actually a foot long. Yeah, good, great. So the other aspect of potential uh, drug development is the female side, which was a real surprise to me uh, when I was um, I've been learning about this. I had known for quite a while about the men's intervention points, but it turns out that once the sperm gets into the female body, there are ways that you can affect the sperm during its development so that it can't do the various little tricks it needs to do to actually complete the fertilization. And here's some of the challenges it needs to go through. Uh, it has to have this pH protection, so you could affect the semen in terms of the uh, alkaline protection. There's a fallopian epithelium reservoir, which where the sperm hang out for a while uh, in case the egg's not quite ready. The sperm has to have highway signals. You're just little old sperm and you're millions and millions of you swimming around, where do you go? Well, there's, there's signaling going on with chemicals and even with potentially some heat seeking aspects there. Uh, and then there's also uterine contractions, which also uh, will bring the sperm up, so it could be um, uh, less sensitive to that. It turns out sperm swimming is really the, a big deal. That's the key. And it has two speeds. It's got low speed, which is your regular swimming up the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, fallopian tubes. And as soon as it gets to the actual outer jelly layer of an egg, it has this high gear. It goes into a hyper uh, tail uh, wagging, swimming to penetrate the jelly layer and get into the, uh, into the egg. And so anything that stops the sperm from swimming, uh, and that could be carried inside the sperm, that, that uh, disablement, um, and several of the drugs going into clinical trials specifically do that, uh, will stop for fertility. So, so here's some of the ways we can influence um, this um, microbiology. And then the benefits of contraception, well, you can imagine they're the benefits of women's contraception in terms of reducing unplanned pregnancy, but it also has some additional ones. Men can exercise their own human right to decide when not to reproduce. They can't decide when to reproduce, which women can do more easily, although still not alone. Uh, but women, uh, uh, men basically do have, in my strong view, and I think most of us have the same right uh, to reproductive autonomy as women. And one of the biggest thing is that fatherhood becomes revitalized. Uh, men are empowered to choose to become fathers as their own decision. They can determine when they would be the best fathers when they're ready. Um, psychologically, physically, socially, uh, in all ways. And men can contribute very actively to the health of their children by three months careful living before they try conception. This is an absolutely invisible area of human health. And one of the things I think we should be doing is really pushing for, um, for this type of research and information. Uh, sperm takes 90 days to develop and the genetic quality of the sperm is influenced just as much by the man's lifestyle, healthy lifestyle, as a woman's um, uh, egg would be uh, affected by her lifestyle. So um, exercise, no drugs, you know, no smoking, um, plenty of sleep. There's a lot of things the men can do to contribute specifically to the health of their child and fewer birth defects. So we do have lower mortality for women. Um, and longer education and career opportunities. We've got um, the benefits to children of higher survival rate of planned pregnancies. Uh, I've talked about the healthy sperm and it protects women specifically, not just from the pregnancy problems, but from the hormonal contraceptive problems. 
Uh, it creates a different emotional environment. It shares the concept of burden in couples. Uh, it uh, multiplies the level of contraceptive protection to near 100%. Remember, neither tubal ligation nor vasectomies are 100%, but if both are using a very, very effective method, and most of the modern methods are over 99%, you do that together, you multiply them, you get to almost 100% with both partners having reversible contraception. And it brings men into the contraceptive issue as their own. It's all the social, religious, um, political, uh, and legal uh, issues suddenly become men's issues as well. And that, that's huge. And we've got this little known and never talked about fact that if we're using 35 billion condoms a year, most of them are made from petroleum, from fossil fuels, or rainforest products. And they are one-time single use and combine it with the manufacturing, foil packaging, the expiration, the fact that you want a certain proportion not to be used and thrown away because they shouldn't be used after the expiration date and disposal. It's a significant issue. And another benefit of men's contraception is that if we use these very, very targeted um, you know, the genetics, the epigenetics, the um, proteins and enzymes. If they're very, very targeted drugs, it's possible we'll have less ecological impact downstream because everybody pees all these things out of their body and it all goes into our rivers and streams and oceans. Uh, it may have less impact than the hormonal uh, if we can use these microbiology uh, techniques. So I'm going to um, uh, speed up a little bit uh, to get to the action part just to let you know, we've got a lot are in clinical or just preclinical state. We've got injections, biodegradable implants, uh, and it looks like at least three to four pills uh, that are going to be in clinical trials this year. We've got one already. We may have two more by the end of this year. And this, the one that's in trial is in blue, Adam by a company called Contraline. That's the gel uh, insert uh, that uh, I mentioned before. There's a hormonal one, this number two, Nest, N-E-S-T, that's the shoulder cream. That's in phase two testing now by NIH, which is pretty far along. And Gendarusa has just gotten stuck over in Indonesia. That's a wonderful natural herb that's been used for hundreds of years in Indonesian culture and um, the main researcher has died and it's just doesn't have the funding to move forward to Western scientific protocols for approval. And then they've got these four that we're going to be looking at uh, for next year. And there's more in the research pipeline. Uh, we've got eight methods in the laboratories right now that are being fine tuned, six more in very early laboratory testing, just to check their effect in this one more that looks interesting and they're just beginning to, to check that one out. And then we have a database with hundreds of more targets possible. So this can this is kind of the way modern medical research is done. Um, so do you wanna take a, should I take a question? Well, if you'd like to take a question now, absolutely. Um, or we could hold them until the end. What would you like um, to do? If you could wait about, uh, about six or 10 minutes. Could you hold that, Celeste? Let me just get through this because um, the action part is still to come. Perfect. All right, so what are we gonna do? How do we get this? Why isn't it out there in CVS or at your doctor's office? Uh, money, 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 inequ inequities, and more money. You can see on the screen, the drug development pipeline is this huge monster industry now, just huge. Uh, but it takes up to $2 billion to get one drug uh, through all the trials and out to market. Uh, agency approval, human clinical trials, this is the really expensive part, the clinical trials, constructing the facilities, supply, and then education and outreach. Uh, here's the clean sheets pill, the F Carcimus Foundation, which has been a, a quiet nonprofit uh, help in the background of this field for the past 20 years. Uh, they, as you can see, they say uh, literally further optimization of the prototypes is on hold pending a funding source. So, um, 
So let's go on to that. So there's a gap right here in the middle called the Valley of Death. We've got a reasonable amount, not a lot, but some philanthropic and government funding here. Believe it or not, all women's and men's contraceptive research on the entire planet last in 2020, $100 million. That's it. It was quite small. Uh, but it is moving forward, as you could see from the prior slides. And this middle section of getting it through the clinical trials uh, and getting it approved is where we have a huge funding challenge. And then once we get through that, we think that the, uh, the, some of the companies will pick it up. So how much will it cost to get 10 methods? Now, remember, we women have 10 methods now. So this is a little high, but still very much within a, a parallel um, parity with women. Here's what we a rough estimate of what each of the phases of development will need. Um, and we're coming up with 23 billion over five years. That's the quicker version. It might be 23 billion over 10 years. And so this will this is aimed at the basic unit cost per method, and then for 10 methods over here on the right. And then the question is, can we really ask for 23 billion? And we have a comparison here to the US military budget, 2.1 trillion, the NASA budget, 25 billion, and some of the benefits of men's contraception versus these other uses of our tax money, which really brings us to the question of back to the beginning. We're not quite finished yet, but it does bring us back to in the fact this really is a certain, to a certain extent, make love, not more. It, five years worth of full contraceptive funding for men, including all manufacturing and distribution and public education for multiple methods is only 1.1% of one year of the US Defense Department. It's unconscionable to me, as I said in the abstract, it's unconscionable to me that we have a solar car on Mars and men on Earth don't have an opportunity to make a choice of when to be a father. So the inequities are not the obvious ones. Um, it turns out that because women get pregnant, FDA approves women's contraceptives that cause more physical harm to women then they are willing to approve for men. The cost benefit for an individual man, I don't take the women's, the partner's uh, health into a, uh, account at all, but if you just look an individual man and the uh, risk to him of an unplanned pregnancy, it's, he has virtually no, no, no risk from it. So if there's a tiny increase, increased risk of blood clots, which we know is a, a, a normal side effect not normal, but a known side effect of the women's uh, pill, hormonal pills, a tiny increased risk of blood clots will disqualify a men's contraceptive, whereas it's ignored for a women's contraceptive. So that's a bit of a, a problem. Uh, FDA has not updated its approval guidelines to be appropriate for male fertility systems. They're still using the women's study outcome of unplanned pregnancy instead of the men's study outcome, which should be sperm count. You don't need to wait nine months or a year to see if the partner's going to get pregnant. You can tell it by the sperm count. So it actually has made the men's contraceptive research much more expensive. Men are not seen as reproductive beings. There's a, a, a lower emphasis in terms of budgeting. Um, Neither the contraceptive burden nor the opportunity are equitable. And we think, I think the next generation methods uh, should um, take advantage of what we've learned from women's contraception and we should innovate and expand so that everybody can, uh, oops. It, um, Margaret, it says it's paused. Oh, resume. Uh, Never mind. Here we go. Phew. <laughs> Got it. Sorry. Thank you. And interestingly enough, the last point is really a hidden gem. No cohesive medical specialty specialty is devoted to men's reproductive health. This issue of what's called uh, the buzzword is paternal effects, which is the quality of the male's 
male contribution to the DNA, the sperm. It's not in medical schools. There's no research. There's just a little bit of documentation. It's, it's just a microscopic um, uh, field. And yet it contributes half the genetic quality or problems to, uh, to a child. So what can we do to support men's reproductive choices? Well, we've got, I, I have been listing them out from my activist experience and uh, my experience also, I worked many years on increasing funding for men's, for women's contraceptive. So eight opportunities. First of all, we can take a position supporting increased funding to the 23 billion and start to get attention to that in some way, um, educating the public, our networks, our local media, et cetera. We can ask NIH to stop investing only in hormonal research and instead flip to only research non-hormonal methods. The Eunice Kennedy Shriver uh, National Institute for Child Health and Development has been the major engine for 50 years spending tax money on failed hormonal men's contraceptive research. We can sue the US government uh, and or slightly more polite, we can ask our federal representatives and certainly we as candidates can take a stand to modify the Affordable Care Act to cover vasectomies. The vasectomies are so much cheaper and safer than women's tubal ligation, but they're not covered by the ACA. Uh, we should ask FDA to include any approved male contraceptives in the future on the same basis in the Affordable Care Act to get immediate coverage in that and, and push the insurance coverage, not to have to then do a separate campaign after approval of it to get insurance coverage. And then also ask for guidelines for male contraceptive research, which would include a sperm count and point instead of uh, fertility, instead of the, the women's pregnancy aspect. You can sign up for information and there are links on the last resource slide. If you want to get a copy of the slides, you'll have links to all these. Uh, the links help. Uh, it provides some visibility when journalists come in and, there's, and cover the topic. And there's been more in the last few years, uh, more general interest. Although they still basically don't quite get it right, but they're, they're coming along. Uh, and then you can also... Sign up for the clinical trials or ask friends to sign up for clinical trials. Doesn't mean you'll be in the clinical trial, but it definitely helps to have a huge, huge uh, pool of potential because they have lots of, um, lots of requirements. For instance, how often you have to come into their laboratories for testing and, and all sorts of different things. So having a, a pool of tens of thousands of men helps get the clinical trials off the ground sooner. You can donate. Uh, I do somewhat, it's, it's on my regular donation list and ask anyone you know with money <laughs> to, to donate. Uh, you can advocate for men's reproductive health in medical schools and men's standard health care. What do men need to know themselves about producing high, healthy, high quality sperm? And finally, uh, a way to pressure the Indian government to commercially distribute the Indian version of the hydrogel which has been approved for five years in India and there's just no investment in it. So here's a list of candidate sample positions. Um, and by the way, I'm trying to leave 15 minutes at the end for our discussion. So that's why I'm pushing through here. Uh, I support reproductive autonomy. And I did have a position statement on my website last year when I ran for governor of Maryland. Didn't cause any grief, interestingly enough, and it was a good talking point to open up some conversations. Uh, supporting immediate large-scale investment in men's contraceptive re research with an emphasis on non-hormonal. Uh, men as well as women deserve a suite of different contraceptive options. We need modern reversible contraception for everyone's sake. Uh, we need to share the contraceptive responsibilities as a couple. Remember the 98% of women at the beginning of this slides that would trust their uh, male partner to use contraception. Uh, and improving men uh, so these are just nice st statements you can just copy and paste if you're comfortable with them into a site. 
And men need to decide for themselves um, when to become a father, which is um, you know, the most important decision in their life because it's affecting other lives directly. So there are two places where this issue has uh, relevance in our current platform. They're in blue. The first of these two slides is in our reproductive rights section, which is under women's rights. Uh, and we talk about clinic availability. Uh, we encourage women and men to prevent unwanted pregnancies. We have great language yeah. right now, uh, but it's it's kind of, um, it, it's, it's good philosophically and in terms of values, but I think it can be, um, uh, tuned in to, to what's needed right now and be more in line with the activism. For instance, we talk a lot about abortion here and we can do the same thing in terms of funding uh, for men's contraception and men's reproductive health care. And then we also say it's the duty of every man to be aware of the functions and health of his and her partner's bodies, which I think is great. Uh, we all need information necessary to make informed decisions. And it Unplanned conception takes control away from individuals, and that's particularly true of men. Uh, that once there's an ejaculation, basically men have no control about what happens uh, with the pregnancy and the child. And so this really is a huge factor um, uh, for for men in terms of um, it, it's it's got to be uh, <laughs> their control has to be at the beginning of the process. And the second place it's in the current platform is in the population section. There's no men's, there's no men's health area actually. And I think it'd be really nice to have a men's health section not, and then maybe have reproductive rights under that, I'm not sure. But we do say that um, a lack of shared responsibility between men and women in family planning and uh, most men are being undereducated and uninvolved. So we've got that up there. And then down here, we've got access to free birth control devices. So that would be great uh, for men to have free birth control as well, counseling and clinics, and implementing family planning education for both genders at all levels of the state school system. And then we end with a very nice freestanding statement. We must promote new traditions and images of men becoming fully involved in all aspects of the family planning process. So I think we have a wonderful set of uh, values and statements in here. And what I would like to propose uh, for us is those who are interested are get together that we form a kind of spontaneous small working group. I call it a, a contraception remix. <laughs> uh, you can see the disc up there with the little earbuds. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and so there's kind of three areas where we could look at as a small group to draft uh, some revisions and updates. One would be structural. Should we have a men's reproductive rights section or should it be an addendum to the women's section or a separate men's health section, whatever, lots of options there. How do we wanna state our goals? Um, intentional choice, which is kind of the same as reproductive autonomy and then health equity, access to the information, the means uh, and uh, to do this, and particularly men knowing that they really should be um, thinking three months in advance, at least uh, before they start trying to have a child. And then our, our specific positions, and these could each be a statement, uh, respect fatherhood by choice as a fundamental human right, invest in safe, reversible, accessible men's contraceptive as a healthcare priority, include men's contraceptives in standard reproductive health care, support education, prefer non-hormonal, endorse both individual and shared responsibility. It's, it's not one or the other, it's both. Both partners should have full control over themselves and then they decide how much they wanna also share that contraceptive burden. They should have the option of doing it themselves and sharing. Uh, ensure it's financially accessible and make sure it's accessible as soon as possible, immediate uh, inclusion. So that's, those are the points I think uh, we could come up with a very good, strong, um, uh, deeply caring and um, actionable uh, platform that, that speaks to the reality of, of the voters, of the men today. 
finally, I got a resources page. Uh, this will, if you want the slides, this will be in there. Here's the actual information, signups for the clinical trials. Uh, all of these are non-hormonal except for this one. And that's because these, um, the hormonal just ends up having so many side effects. I said that here's the two organizations, Male Contraceptive Initiative. Um, I ha helped get this started 11 years ago. Um, I was the first secretary of the board for about six months, just helped it get off the ground and then went off to do other things. But it's been, uh, it's been started most partly by um, people concerned about uh, men not having reproductive choices, but also by a retired HIV researcher who said he was frustrated his whole career that his institutions were only funding women's uh, contraceptives. He was working in HIV, uh, particularly on the men's angle, and just didn't see enough. So uh, this one, Center for Male Contraceptive Research and Development, is, only does hormonal. There's only one book. This is just shocking to me. Only one book on the entire field, and it's only on one tiny little bit of the field. It's the most undeveloped place uh, we could, uh, part of, of, of critical part of human life uh, uh, that we have. And this is only about the reproductive health care and actual perceptions of men's reproductive health care. It's not even about contraceptives, really. So uh, this is the clinical trial site, classic.clinicaltrials.gov. If you want to sign up through there for a clinical trial, or many of these other websites uh, also have sign up uh, options there. And on social media, of course, it's hilarious. Uh, Not the Father. There was a television show called Not the Father with Maury Povich. Um, Love without the glove. Uh, don't underestimate your fertility. But the, the memes out there on the on the web are really fun. Uh, so that's um, the uh, that's the last the last major uh, piece of information, and uh, I would hope that folks feel like it's worth investing our deeply precious personal activism time into this field. Uh, and for me, um, uh, love without the glove is kind of cute. I, I love this, but to me, it's a rather um, very male image. And I, I personally prefer uh, this as my closing image is when you're ready. The beauty of, of fatherhood um, when the parent is ready. So, all right. Uh, thank you. We've now got um, actually some time for questions. We do. We have just over 15 minutes, actually. Uh, thank you very much, Nancy. That was a great presentation. I think there was a lot of good discussion in the chat. Um, so there's two ways I would recommend, like maybe we could turn off your screen sharing and then we can see everyone and then we can have a, a good uh, conversation with people. Um, and if you'd like to use the react button down at the bottom, you can uh, do the raise hand feature and then you'll get right to the top and we can make sure that we see everyone who wants to have a question and get that answered. Um, <clears throat> yay. All right. Thank you very much. And here we go. Uh, Celeste, you're up first. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, what an exciting day to be here with the Green Party. Um, let's see, a little background information about me since I came in late. I apologize. I just literally got the email five minutes before entering, and I don't know how that happened. Um, I think it was my wrong inbox. I started voting at 18. No, I think I was 19 maybe years old. I think I was 20. 20 or 19 years old, 19 or 20 years old. And um, it was between George Bush and President um, John Kerry. And I was registered Green Party since 18. Uh, I was inspired by um, a, a um, administrative faculty member at my high school. And um, I was very excited to vote. And of course I had my own opinions about everything, you know, socially pragmatic and um short-sighted and uh so um i voted for john Kerry, and of course i did college democrats as well just to help out the obama campaign on my campus and i was force fed to register myself as democrat against my will unfortunately as i was appointed vice president of the chapter on my campus and uh, apologetically, um, I've been redeeming myself as I'm now in Texas, and I've been trying to um, 
reform back into Green Party mode. And um, now as a conservative, as I was raised in a liberal household. And uh, uh, Celeste, only... Celeste, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, do you have a question or a topic specifically? Yes, I, was wondering, I was wondering if we could somehow, um, I was wondering if somehow we could rally to get um, holistic reproductive health care in all states. Thank you. Yes, I, well, that would certainly be our goal and I would strongly support us having, uh, I like the word, um, the holistic uh, reproductive health care. That's a new, new phrase right there. Um, so I'll, I'll write that down and take it. And if we get a small group going, put that in for the. Uh... And just to let you know, I'm sorry, but um, they, I did read last year, two years ago, that they are doing that in Utah. It's All right. Their Medicare program. I will check that out because interestingly enough, four years ago, the Utah state legislature, the only one, uh, passed a bill requiring fathers to pay for half of all pregnancy costs and half of all delivery costs. So maybe that has led to some more interested interest in male contraception. Uh, I'll follow that up. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question, Celeste. Does anyone else have one for Nancy or any of the um, topic that we've discussed today? Uh, Patricia, uh, go ahead, please. Okay. So you're wondering earlier, oh, sorry. You're wondering earlier where all of this should be included, whether it should go in women's health or men's health. Uh, how about the Medicare for all area? Put everything there instead of separating it into men's health and women's health. Mm -hmm. Separate men's yeah. health and women's health underneath Medicare and expanded Medicare would like to call it Medicaid for all. Maybe yeah. we could enlarge that to health. Um, I would separate the fund. I would separate the contraception between men's reproductive health because I don't think there's even a program for reproductive health for men in this uh, country. Well, that right. But it's part of health. That's the whole thing. It's part of health. So it can it be, be health. It can reproductive be, it can health. be readjust however you want to, but all the health stuff should be in one place and then sub subtitled however you want it. And then there'll be no confusion about somebody having to read over here and then having to read over there. And then it'll just be, here's everything. Yeah, that's interesting. In the women's section right now, it flips uh, or has a, uh, suggests that you go to the foreign affairs section because that talks about the Mexico City policy and the abortion funding overseas. And thank you very much. Uh, Robin, you're on the stack. Go ahead, please. Hi, my question is, I'm Robin. Nice to meet you, Ms. Nancy. Uh, why do you think that there's not a lot of medical information about this topic in your research? The, I, I think it's the fundamental um, uh, Perception, which in some ways is accurate from a feminist standpoint, that women bear the burden, 99% the burden of reproduction and, and the, the burden, meaning having five or 10 or 15 children to feed every morning and take care of. Uh, but uh, there's also the, um, the sexist aspect, uh, which is the same thing. And unfortunately, men have often through history seen women as the vessels of sexuality and not wanting to acknowledge and take ownership of their own sexuality. And so they don't um, see themselves as sexual or reproductive actors. They have like, they want sex, but um, it's, it's not connected with reproduction that much. Whereas women, it really is. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a lot of the standard paradigms just don't fit in men's reproductive and contraceptive aspects. So for the most part, I've kind of given up trying to worry about it. And I just want progress. I want men to have great reversible contraception, personally. Thank you. And Joy, you're on the stack. Uh, go ahead, please. Okay. Hey, um, um, uh, you know, I get, 
um, I get in a lot of trouble when I say anything about um, population concerns. Um, uh, uh, and, um, and it's been a new pointed out to me, um, uh, but not, not infrequently that as if we just would educate women enough, if we would just get women sufficiently educated that, uh, that, it, that population, um, human population comes under uh, better control the minute that that happens. I just want to say that this is also, get, if we do this, we can say the same thing about men. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, I'm, it's, uh, it, uh, oh, if, <laughs> if there's like uh, your education dollar just, you know, had, had now has twice the impact. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, it's, um, it's fascinating that a whole other aspect of this is looking at who makes the decision and how, um, about how many children to have in a relationship. And looking back through uh, particularly um, indigenous peoples, uh, they have a, they've had ways of just changing them, of controlling them. The Native Americans, um, for instance, in the Hudson Bay Company, and, um, and even in non-Indigenous, non um, Russia has been paying, uh, you, you become a hero of Russia if you're a mother with 10 children. And there's been all these attempts to manipulate the decision on how many children to have. And the only one that works is, it, it's not, um, you know, sometimes the governments are trying to pump them up the numbers and sometimes the governments are trying to lower them. Uh, but the what's really the profound lessons learned from women's contraceptive is don't try and go for a goal. Just let people make their own decisions and they will take into account all the factors uh, in their life that they perceive are relevant to their decision to childbearing. And, and, and the fact that we've missed half the human race for the last 70 years is rather shocking. <laughs> It pretty much is. Uh, and you're right. Like that's a, a really sadly unexplored realm of healthcare. Uh, welcome, Craig. Thanks for joining us here at, at the very close of the session. Um, you kind of missed most of the presentation, but uh, maybe you caught the title of it and some of it before you popped into the room. I did. And I'm hoping to watch uh, the recording later. I got a little tied up with something. You, you, everyone will be able to watch the recordings. They should be available within the week on the YouTube site, um, the full recording here. Um, that'll be the case for every workshop as well if you've missed any, any place during the A&M this year. Um, what about the slides, Margaret Elizabeth? Should I, should we, are the slides available as well or should I send them or should I just, actually I can just tell you uh, my email, uh, nwallace2017 at gmail. Um, I have not uploaded these yet. I was still fine tuning them, reviewing them with uh, some experts today, this afternoon. Um, but uh, that that will work just fine. Um, and um, you can also um, check my. Um, I guess it's harder to get me through my website. I've left my governor website up from last year, but just uh, N Wallace is fine. At 2017. Perfect. And it's. It's it's a lovely topic. I just you know I've said it before at the beginning when I showed you that beautiful first photo of the of the fallopian tubes with the sperm in them and then, and all the little tendrils and the this is and the that's and it's just it has just you know reinforced and and made blossom again my my appreciation of the glory of the life that we are blessed with right now. I just want to remind everyone too that. Um, this workshop is really a call to action as well. So this is like, let's put together a working group out of here and create these platform positions in the party, advance them and get them voted on. So uh, very much this is a, an active project rather than just a, like take some knowledge in kind of thing. So please make sure to reach out to Nancy if you are interested in working on this and helping with that project. 
And, and I, I think by the with the schedule of the platform committee, we would have about four months. I think four to five months before we'd be expected to bring forward a solid proposal and it would then be considered and voted on sometime next year. So um, just let's get in touch and let's be the, and th I think this is a phenomenal political space for us. This is just so real uh, to, to men, it's speaking one-to-one -to, -one to men. And it's like, yeah, we're the ones who are here with you in your real life, like get a clue. And if we spend 1.1% of the defense department on men's contraceptive, Four billion human beings will have the ability to decide when to be a father and control their lives. And that's that's like, oh yeah, okay, <laughs> let's do it. Reproductive health care for everyone, Medicare for all. That's the way to go with it. Uh, Nancy, um, we're kind of uh, close to the very end now. We've got about nine minutes left. Are there any final uh, closing thoughts you'd like to offer? I think I kind of just did, which it's <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been um, something I I came to after working on women's contraceptive uh, funding and uh, was actually a co-signer through one of my jobs on one of the Supreme Court abortion cases and did you know 30 years as a feminist on women's contraception and as I get older this little tiny thought came creeping along into my brain and it took a few years to kind of come to consciousness and and flourish and said. What about men? And um, then I reached out and I found a small group of people, about six people, literally in the United States, that were working under the uh, with the Parsimus Foundation initially, and that uh, had been spurred by this guy in India, bless his heart, who came up with this great hydrogel idea, and uh, so kind of helped a little bit with male contraceptive initiative get going, and they've grown, uh, and now they have you know a small amount of full time staff. And the relationship with the Gates Foundation, which refused to consider men's contraceptives for like 10 years. Uh, and they're now gradually coming over NIH, the new director. So the, all the players are beginning to talk, the players that have refused to talk in the, in the big money field. Um, but we need much more money. But anyway, so it's, it's fascinating. And the, to find that there's a huge area of the human body that I knew nothing about has been really fun. Uh, it's been uh, uh, entrancing and entertaining to learn about it. Uh, and I, I really look forward to us being the first out there to the electorate to say, we're on your side. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, everyone, I just want to uh, point out we have two, uh, three more uh, events this, this evening, um, two coming up fairly soon uh, at 2.30. Uh, at, on the P stage is the Put This Black Out Front, the Unapologetically Black and Green Session. And uh, that's on the P stage and on the Democracy stage at uh, 2.30 as well will be the Candidate Cafe, where candidates from around the country will be dropping in and hanging out and you can chat with them. The next thing after those is tonight at 5 p.m. All these are uh, Pacific Coast times. If you live in a different time zone, I'm sorry, you'll have to sort of sort that for yourself. Um, but anyway, in about uh, two hours, so like 5 p.m. is the Young Greens Perspectives, uh, takeaways from the Global Greens Conference. And then um, we'll be uh, having a screening of the film Healing Us, Medicare for All, starting tonight around 645. I hope to see you all at the next upcoming sessions and at the film this evening. And if I don't see you today, I will see you tomorrow uh, during the workshops and our uh, keynote address. <laughs> Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you very much, Nancy, for providing us with this very educational workshop. Thanks, Greens, for participating and spending your time with us today and trying to change this world for the better. We'll see you all soon. Bye, everyone.